Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Friends, aren't you grateful that the Lord did not leave us alone just to follow our own ways, but he has given us his written word preserved throughout time so that we can guide and direct our lives thereby? And if you are a lover of the word of God, you know, unlike many of the things, matter of fact, all of the things that are offered in this life, nothing lights our souls like when we open the word of God and we allow his truth to penetrate our hearts and enlighten our eyes. Hallelujah, friends. What a blessing. And I pray that you are spending much time in the word of God. Well, today is February the 14th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and we've been talking about the exodus of the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. And when we were last together, we saw that the people gathered all their things quickly left Egypt after the 10 plagues and are making their way to the Red Sea. And that's where we pick up today in Exodus chapter 14. It says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn to encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Balsavon. Before it, shall you encamp by the sea. Now remember, there's over a million people. Once they arrive at the Red Sea, they're going to make camp there because they are blocked between the Red Sea and Egypt. And so in verse three, it says, Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. In other words, they're trapped. And God says in verse four, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he will follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh. Notice that. I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host. Pharaoh will look at me as the Almighty. Even in that moment, he will recognize that there is none above me. And I will do this that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Notice again He's doing this that the Egyptians would know he is God, not the people of Israel. They already know that he is the Almighty. They already know he is the true and living one. They already know and believe that he is the creator of all things. They already know that all men everywhere should honor and glorify him. But God is doing this so that the Egyptians may know that their gods are weak and that Yahweh is the true and living God. Well, it was told the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, that the people had left the city. And so the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And as we just read, it was Yahweh that turned their hearts against the people. And they said to themselves, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Key word, serving. The people understand that the millions of Israelites have been slaves unto them and have been doing some of the most laborious work in all of Egypt. And if the people of Israel are gone, who's going to do that work? Well, the Egyptians themselves. And this isn't welcome news to them. So they want to go and get their slaves. Well, Pharaoh made ready his chariot in verse six and took his people with him. Now he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and all the captains over every one of those chariots. And in verse 9, it says, The Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses, all the chariots of Pharaoh, all of his horsemen, and all of his army. And they overtook them while the children of Israel were encamped by the sea. Now when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and they saw the Egyptians coming after them, and they were sore afraid. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. 
They're not warriors, not yet. There is none among them who have been trained in the art of warfare. And so obviously they have much reason to be afraid. And so the children, as God's children always do in a time of need, when they understand that they cannot meet the obstacle they are facing with their own power, they cry out to God. We too, friends, when we face circumstances in life that are beyond our control, in which we have no way of altering the circumstances on our own, we cry out to God for help. And God is honored through this cry. And after having cried out unto the Lord, now they cry out to his spokesman, their leader, Moses, in verse 11. And they said unto him, why have you brought us into the wilderness to die? Isn't this what we told you when we were in Egypt? We said unto you, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For we would rather serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, and the words of Moses, written some 3,500, 4,000 years ago, speak out to us today, friends, when he says, stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. You know, that's the hardest thing to do in our relationship with God, because we are so prone by our own effort to try to change our circumstances. But Moses says to the people that day and to us now, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For these Egyptians that you are looking on today, you will never see them again. It is the Lord Yahweh, the Almighty. He will fight for you. You are his children. You are his beloved. You are his chosen. You are his elect. And he will fight for you, friend, just as he fought for the people of Israel that day. You have no idea of the spiritual warfare that is taking place around your life all the time. And many of the things that you think are circumstantial or you may not even be aware of, there is a vicious battle going on to protect you because you are the chosen of the Lord. And so the Lord tells Moses in verse 16, lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide the sea. And the children of Israel shall go through on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So there are two miracles that are taking place here. One, the sea is going to split in two, making a path to the other side. And second is that the path will not be mud which it should have been because it's been under the waters of the sea for who knows how long, yet they're going to walk across on dry ground. And the Almighty continues in verse 17 and says, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and so they will follow you into the midst of the sea. And again, this will bring me honor from Pharaoh, from all of his host, all of his chariots, all of his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. I am the Almighty. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, now removes himself and goes behind them. He is protecting them where they cannot protect themselves. And so it is with us, friends, as we continue on our journey, pressing forward, anything that would try to sneak up behind us God is there protecting us, keeping us from harm. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them as well. And it camped between the camp of Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It gave darkness to the Egyptians and it gave light to the children of Israel. And so in verse 21, Moses now stretches out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and he made the sea dry land. Therefore, the waters were divided, and the children of Israel, all million plus of them, went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. Now, even though there's a million plus of the Israelites, think about all the herds and cattle and sheep and goats 
and the other animals that went with them. This is a vast amount of people and beasts, and surely it took them some time to cross the Red Sea. But as they traveled through on dry ground, the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians, seeing this, pursued after the people. And the entire army of the Egyptians went into the midst of the sea. And as the morning began to break, the sun began to rise. The Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians, which were pursuing after the children of Israel, and he took off their chariot wheels. And the Egyptians, recognizing that the hand of God is fighting on behalf of the people of Israel, say to themselves, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against us. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. Now that all the people of Israel are on the other side of the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians tried to flee, but the Lord overthrew them in the middle of the sea. And the text doesn't tell us, but most likely Pharaoh is watching all of this take place. He isn't in the midst of the sea. And so if this is true, Pharaoh is going to return to a devastated Egypt based upon the 10 plagues that came upon them. And he's going to return with just himself and maybe a few men because his entire army has been wiped out in the Red Sea. But again, this is speculation because Pharaoh may have been down in the midst of the sea. And so it may be that the Egyptians have no ruler because Pharaoh and his entire army have been killed. I lean toward the idea, as most generals of armies would, they would be standing high watching their army battle and they wouldn't be down in the middle of the pursuit. Well, as the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, notice it doesn't say Pharaoh, it says the host of Pharaoh, his army, there remained not so much as one of them. But on the other side of the Red Sea, the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. I mean, you can imagine the amount of bodies that are just floating in the water, and as the water closes up, presses toward the seashore, these bodies are being washed ashore. And Israel saw the great work which their God, their Lord, did unto the Egyptians. And because of this, the people feared the Lord. They reverenced the Lord. They honored the Lord. And even though they believed in the Lord before this event, their belief has become even more steadfast because they have just seen God act on their behalf. And they also reverence Moses because they see Moses as a great leader, a spokesman for God, an agent for God, because they saw what Moses did and how God answered. And so the people recognizing this in chapter 15, verse 1, they and Moses together began to sing unto the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. He is my song. He has become my salvation. Hallelujah. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Who sits at the right hand of the Father? Jesus. Could this be the pre-incarnate Jesus before he took human flesh? 
could the right hand of the Lord be recognizing the person of Jesus? I believe that it is. In verse 17, it says, In the greatness of thine excellency, O God, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Notice the people do not say God has overthrown those who rose up against us, but the attack was upon God. It was upon his name, his person, his character. And for this, God sent forth his wrath, and it consumed them as stubble. With the blast of thy nostrils, O God, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. Doesn't that sound like what Lucifer said in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28? When he said, I will exalt myself above you. I will take your seat of power. I will take your throne. And the people continue by saying, our lust shall be satisfied upon the people of Israel. We will draw our sword and our hand will destroy them. But, O God, you have blown with your wind. The sea covered them and they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders among thy people? Thou stretched out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them up. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people of all the nations round about shall hear of these things and they will be afraid because of how you work among your people. In verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now notice how these people are caught in this momentary experience of praise and worship because everything is going their way right now. But notice what they do as soon as suffering hits. It says in verse 22, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. So they're out in the middle of the desert where there is very little vegetation, hardly no water, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And when they finally did come upon water in a place called Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for the waters were bitter. And now notice how fickle these people are how immature they are in their relationship with God. Immediately, the people forgot everything that God had just done for them, and they murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? God has just performed a supernatural act. Isn't he the same God that could give them water, even in the most barren of places? Friends, when we feel like we're in a barren place, do we not look to the hand of the Lord to sustain us? Unfortunately not. Most of us begin to murmur. We begin to question the Lord. We begin to complain against the Lord. And that's what they did. So in verse 25, Moses cries unto the Lord, and the Lord showed Moses a tree. And when Moses had cast the tree into the waters, the waters that were once bitter were made sweet. Friends, that's a perfect example of what takes place within us at the moment of salvation. What once was bitter, ugly, dark, and evil, now is sweet, full of light and righteousness. And it happened at the very moment when God exchanged our hearts, making what was once bitter, now sweet. And Moses says in verse 26 to the people then, and so he says to us today, if, that's a condition, friends, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and you will do that which is right in his sight, and you will pay close attention to his commandments, and you will keep all his statutes, not just some of them, all his statutes, then God will put none of these diseases upon you, you which he has brought out of darkness, for he is the God that heals thee. But notice again, there's a condition there. If you do these things, this is what God will do. And you're going to see this repeated throughout the Bible. And that's why it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if you will pray, if you will seek my face, 
if you will humble yourself and turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and then I will heal your land. Oh, friends, what we see through this is that nothing has changed. The God that was the God unto the people of Moses' time is the same God unto us today. And the same offerings that he gave unto them, so he gives today. The same conditions that were placed upon them are the same conditions that are placed upon us today. The same commandments, statutes, and ordinances they were to live by are the same commandments, statutes, and ordinances that we are to live by today. God wants all of our attention. He wants all of our focus. He wants all of our time. He wants all of our resources. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And anything that comes short of that is not acceptable in his sight. There is no room in the kingdom for half-heartedness, mediocrity, compromise. God wants all of us, or he wants nothing at all. Oh, friend, are you giving all of yourself today? Are you giving him everything you have? Are you constantly focused upon the things that are important to him? Are your lips speaking of him always? Is your mind meditating upon the things in his word, feasting upon all the things that he has told us and taught us? Are your hands busy doing good works unto others? Are you transparent in looking into your heart and giving great attention to your attitudes, your emotions, and your feelings? Are you bringing everything in your life under the power and the authority of God's word and doing everything in your power, relying upon his power to be transformed into the man and woman of God that he has so created you to be. I trust that you are friends. Well, we're going to close there today. And I'm so grateful again that you're with us. I pray that the Lord Jesus will bless your journey today. I pray that your heart will be full of tenderness and mercy. I pray that your mind will be filled with wisdom and truth. And I pray most of all that you will learn what it means to stand still and see the salvation of God work in and through your life so that you and others will give God Almighty all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.